um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. How are you? I don't bite. You could like move a little bit like closer <laughs> if you want, like so I could see you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, Clementine was just six when the mass killing of 1994 broke out in Rwanda, um, and she spent she tells her a wonderful story in the book, The Girl Who Smiled Beads, of moving from country to country in Africa and eventually to the United States, to Yale, to tell her story. Um, so we're going to tell a little bit about that. We're going to go into the narrative of The Girl Who Smiled Beads and talk a little bit about um, what it means for us, for identity, for building community, for forging connections. So with that, um, we'll kick off. Um, so your life has been so dynamic and full of accomplishments, so this might be one of the least interesting things about you, but you were a Googler. I think the audience would love to, to know about that. Can you tell us a bit about your time at Google? Yes. Um, well, first of all, I want to say thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's such a pleasure. And Kelly has gone above and beyond to get me here, to get the bookstore. So thank you so much for having me and yeah. connecting, reconnecting me back to the community. Uh, and all of you, thank you so much. Uh, for taking the train and uh, being here, uh, taking some time from the office to be here. So I really appreciate it. Uh, and for everybody who's viewing live, hello. Um, thank you uh, for pausing and to come and to listen. So my tour uh, this uh, fall is listening tour. And so I'm doing a lot of listening as well as sharing about the girl who smiled beads. Um, and it's so wonderful to come back to Google, uh, not to come to hang out with my friend and eat the food here, because that's what I usually do, but I come and share the book. Uh, I uh, interned uh, with Google Bold uh, in 2010 uh, in San Francisco. And one of my uh, mentor, mentee as well, uh, Teresa, invited me to the community. And I had so much fun. I connected with people from all over the world. Um, as you know, Google Bold is super diverse. And not only in you know different places where you come from, but also just perspective. And I fell in love with. Uh, with San Francisco, but with Google, I was like, oh, maybe I could go to South Africa and do the same thing that I was doing here at Google. And, uh, and I was with .org and marketing team. Um, and I was telling Kelly earlier that I spent so much time on the internet trying to get so many nonprofits and small businesses on a Google map. So if you are a nonprofit, uh, and you were in a Google map into between 2010 and 11. I'm that girl who made sure that you were there. Um, and yeah, that's that's. But but even that. So I've been uh, with the content creator um, summit for the past four years, and I've been traveling back and forth and meeting all these incredible content creator with YouTube in London and in LA and, and here in New York as well. Very much part of the community, but yeah. part of the family. Mm. Um, so onto the book. Mm. The first episodes of your life in Rwanda are one of a totally idyllic childhood. Can you paint a picture for the audience of what your childhood was like, maybe through images of your mother's garden or mm. through the stories your nanny would tell you? Yes. How many of you have had a chance to read the book? All right, this, this is good, so half of you. Um, so, you know, I had a childhood that I would wish for anybody. And I have, you know, I've, I grew up in nine different countries and I have traveled to about, you know, 20 something countries. And the childhood that I had, I wish it for my friends, for my family, for anyone. And, and that means where you feel accepted uh, by everybody and those who don't accept you uh, at least for me I didn't I didn't know what that was like um, except one instant that I had but a really great example that I would give you growing up in uh, in Kigali um, it actually two examples one um, our home uh, my mother I think maybe after she married my dad she had this 
idea of creating the Garden of Eden right in front of our house. And so if you had to come to our house, my mom would have asked you where you're from, and you say, I'm from this place. And then after that, she's like, so what flower is your, or your flower from your state or your country? What fruit? And my mom would engineer would we'll ask you to bring the seed or she'll find it and then we'll engineer the flower or the, or the plant, whatever it is. And so when you come back next time, you'll find the plant of your country or your state in our garden. So I grew up with all of these different flowers from all over the world, all these different fruits, um, all these different vegetables, uh, because my mother had this goal of creating the Garden of Eden. She just didn't like the story ending where Adam and Eve have to walk out of the garden. She was like, nope, we're not doing that. Um, <laughs> so that's my mother, and, and, and she's, uh, she's, you know, I always feel like she's a soil whisper, and she just, able to grow anything um, and I spent some time with her sending me go get this go do this go th do that and so I grew up really understanding the world through flowers and the world through all these different plants and uh, another one uh, we had this you know, very young bride, maybe she was like 20 or 21, uh, and she wanted to have children, but for some reason, um, not yet, I mean, because she was 20 something. But I remember on weekends, she would cook. I mean, she would wake up and cook. And she would have all kinds of treats. I'm not sure if you know bajia and beignet, and make lots of like biryani rice because she was um, she was half Rwandan, half Indian, and so she make all these like biryani like with rice with vegetables, and she make sambusas. And then she would just take this giant plate and she would just bang it. And all of us, I mean, maybe like 20, 25 kids, will all go and just line up and eat. And she would play music for us. And so th that is the childhood that I had. And I thought that everyone, you know, everyone in my neighborhood, that's how they lived, except this one person who I went to their house and they were having lunch and they didn't feed me. And my mom had told me never to go there for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I remember coming back and I was so sad and I was crying. And my mom was like, I told her never to go there for lunch or dinner. And, and she's like, and I'm like, what is it that she's done? It's like, bari mana. You know, kui mana in Kinyarwanda means to separate yourself from the creator. That means to not share. And, and so I grew up in a place where sharing and connecting not only with your neighbors, your friends, um, from, the, you know, from, from the minute that I, I was aware that I was conscious and I was human, uh, that was the way, that was my childhood. Mm -hmm. But things changed for you very early on. You have that beautiful story about your childhood and then war broke out. Um, you were forced from your home with your older sister, just the two of you, um, out in the world. You lived in um, several refugee camps in Burundi, Tanzania, Malawi. What was the day-to-day -day reality like for you in those situations? Well, it's taken me about 20-something years to be able to get to a place where first I could talk about it. Um, and then second, I could be able to rationalize about it. And, and this is why I wrote The Girl Who Smiled Beads. I wrote The Girl Who Smiled Beads because I thought in all the places and everything that happened to us, I was just an observer taking it all in. And now, sitting here with you and in front of all of you, I'm realizing that's actually, in fact, true. So some of you might know what happened in Rwanda in 1994, where millions of people were murdered and millions of others were displaced all over the world. And it's because we believed in a story and in the propaganda that this person is less than. That's why we got into a place where 
neighbors turned against each other. You know, neighbors killed their neighbors, friends killed their friends. Um, but also there are those people who decided not to do that. And all of it as a result from deep lack of, of, of abundance in being human. Uh, at least that's how I, w I, I say it. And, and it's something, as a child, of course, I didn't understand. I couldn't even comprehend. Even as an adult, I don't understand how a husband could kill a wife and the children because someone said that they're Tutsi. Um, or an, an ideology, of course, in the practice. But, you know, learning about it through books later on as a college student and a little bit of, as a high school student, I couldn't understand it. So I started studying more of like, you know, what has happened in different parts of Europe, uh, the Holocaust, what has happened in Cambodia, what has happened in, in different parts of South America, what's even happened here. Uh, today is the Indigenous Peoples Day. And thinking about that, that's not far away. We are not far away from that in itself. So what happened here in America also happened in Rwanda, but what happened in Rwanda was 1994. And my older sister and I were few of people who were able to escape at the beginning of the conflict. And my sister, uh, Claire, uh, was 15 at that time. I was six. And for the, next, um, for the next six years and a half, we went from country to another seeking refuge. And what is the day today? of a person seeking a refuge. I've written all about it. I've gotten closer to paint words and to be able to make you feel, and not just only to help you intellectualize who did it when and where. Um, to be a person who's seeking a refuge, you do not have a piece of paper. In fact, when I go to a bar or a club sometime and they ask me for my ID, it's such a huge trigger. I'm like, <gasps> do I have an ID? Because my whole life was that. We had to go from one country to another. And if you don't ha have an identification card, then you were sent into jail or you're put in a prison, which is, you know, in jail or prison or a refugee camp, which is equivalent of prison. And life in, you walk, you wake up, you walk, and you sleep outside, and uh, you, you feel, at least for me as a child, I felt very ashamed um, that there were all these homes and we were not allowed to be in it or near it. Um, and now as an adult, I still feel that sense of how in which we separate ourselves, um, that some people have homes, some people have papers, and some people don't have papers. And in refugee camp, oh my goodness, I cannot wait for people to come forward uh, and share and add to the girl who smile beads and tell you what the life is like. It's not a life that I wish for anybody. Um, and. And of course, seeking refuge in the United States, we came in 2000, Claire and I came in 2000 after living to all those countries. And uh, we came with the organization International Migration, which uh, resettles uh, people who are seeking refuge all over the world. And it was a moment to be able to pause, definitely. And so I hope that I have answered your question. Absolutely. I was kind of trying to cover all grounds you for everybody. Yeah. Well, it's so remarkable how you've turned such a, a powerful and unfair situation into a platform that's so hope-inducing for all of us. It's yeah. super inspirational. Um, but you mentioned themes of self-identity, and that's super relevant to this group because for Women at America's Platforms, we talk a lot about both self-identity and forging connections. Mm -hmm. um, so on the topic of self-identity, I wanted to ask you about your experience that you write about in The Girl Who Smiled Beads. Um, you and Claire are constantly trying to 
um, forge your own self-identity despite these really challenging circumstances. And two scenes that struck me as particularly visceral evocations of that were when you were first in a refugee camp, um, six or seven years old, and you were writing your name in the sand, saying it to anybody who would listen, constantly reminding yourself that you were an individual with a name. And the second scene was when you were in Illinois and had to apply for your identification and choose what name to put on there. Yeah. Um, what can you tell us about how your relationship with your self-identity has changed over your journey? Well, it's been an incredible work. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, each one of us in this room, I'm sure there was a point where we've had to pause to be able to say, who am I, where am I? Um, the person or the color or whatever it is label to be able to be you, you don't fit in. You don't, it's a box. You don't, you want to come out. And so each one of us have different ways to be able to really go deep into ourselves, into our soul. Uh, for me, I feel like every year varies. Um, and I probably could just talk about recently. I think recently, uh, maybe about two years ago, I went on a, on a tour, I made up this tour for myself, and went around and, um, and started talking to students about, you know, we're going beyond labels. And the students had to fill out all the labels that they feel like they fit in, but all the labels that they don't want to fit in anymore. And, uh, and so it was all the labels based on like your gender, your sexuality, uh, your race, your class. Your, and so all the students were teaching me. I thought that I was teaching them. They're actually teaching me how to be within myself. And so with Rwanda, uh, we, uh, through, of course, like colonialism, um, at first it was the Germans, and then after it was Belgians, and all the German experience, uh, experiments through, like, you know, your skull, your da da da, your this, your this, your this, and therefore you, you fall into the Aryan looking person, so which means you, you know, Caucasian features. And, and so growing up with, with that, like later on starting to learn about it, actually I started learning about it in the camp in the first camp and and I didn't understand this like you know something about your wrist and something about your legs and something about your nose and something about your hair and I was just so confused I didn't get it and as I become an adult uh, I am seeing you know uh, these kind of ways of being uh, in America and I'm seeing it in South America and I'm seeing it in Europe and I'm like what is going on here uh, because when you are a child, you're just a baby, you're just are beautiful. And so the practice for me in terms of understanding my identity has been really getting deep into my senses. So if you ever come to any of my parties are like five sense experience, try to get to the sixth sense, which means you're really deep soul. And, and so from, you know, smell uh, to, to touch, to sight, to all the things that are making me here now. Um, and so to really understand that with myself and that as myself, there's such a short period that I'm on this, when I could still breathe and when I could still hear and where I could still see, and I'm going to take advantage of that and be able to remind my friends and my family like how awesome that is. And that is my identity, my identity that I'm connected to every creature and every person and everything around me. But it's not easy and that's why you forge you know, your identity um, beyond your skin color. Um, and to be able to skin color itself is really important, but to know that all under is just this gooeyness of muscles and, and bones and stuff. <laughs> Sometimes it's creepy when you think about it. Yeah. You're like, oh, there it is, just skeleton walking around. Um, so I hope that I've answered the question, and I'm, you know, I'm still, I'm still trying to figure out. But through many authors um, and many musicians, all artists, I'm still trying to 
learn how to be me in this world yeah. where he says that I am not present. There is um, a beautiful feedback loop with something that we talk about a lot in the employee resources groups, which is imposter syndrome or sense of not belonging. Um, you write about this a little in your book um, because you landed at an elite boarding school in Yale um, where you had to adjust to people's expectations of you. Um, you were very enthused by what you were learning, but also challenged to find a way to fit in or whether to fit in. Um, what can you tell us, for those of us who struggle with imposter syndrome or sense of belonging, how did you get through to thriving in those situations? So one, I would say, as a child, that was forced on me. And so, you know, Claire telling me, all right, we are going to learn Swahili now. So we have about a month <laughs> go. Yeah. And having to learn Swahili, having to learn Nyanja, having to learn Zulu, have to learn Portuguese so that we don't get thrown in jail. Yeah. So that is a high stake. And millions of people right now all over the world who are seeking refuge are going through that as I'm speaking so that they can try to fit in, like different outfits, you know, cut your hair, you braid your hair, you do all these different things to just get the body to be accepted. I would say that the first thing, as people who have food, shelter, friends, family, at least like on Mazar's hierarchy, if you have the basics, to be able to realize that how others trying to make you feel like you don't belong it's an illusion. It's absolutely an illusion. It's not real, it's fake. It's all fake. Because when you're stuck in only in that place of fear that you don't belong, you miss the whole ground of your being and of other people's being. That's what I've realized. And two, all of us come from uh, this place called a womb. <laughs> Until, of course, there's gonna be AI walking around very soon. We need to get our literally shit together as a human. Because if we cannot get our act together as human, how are we expecting to be with this new being that are going to be entering our daily lives? Well. My phone now, like we always say, is like, where does it go, where does it go? You know, like that is taking all my data every single day. That could be a part of my conscience in the future. And so then therefore, if our generation, we have an opportunity our generation to be able to pass through all these different molds. And so within that, I ask you to really, you know, read Audre Lorde. Audre Lorde is phenomenal. Everything by Audre Lorde, but Sister Outsider, it's incredible. Octavia Butler, um, all of Octavia Butler's books, buy all of them and sit and listen, you know, sometimes listen to it and just understand the way in which she was programming our moment. Um, and I'll also say with uh, same times, you know, James Baldwin also adds so much into, uh, into our senses and being present as a human, but also as a people of, of, of who wants to be liberated out of this thing that we so truly believe it's only us. And then also, I will close out by saying this, it's, it's you know, with this question of, of belonging, you belong here as much as I belong here. I belong here as much as you belong here. I'm not better than you, and you're not better than me. And when you wake up every morning, at least I could speak for myself, when I wake up every morning, that's my meditation. And going beyond that is also all the animals and, and, and all everything that is, is, is around us also belongs here. And it sounds very hippie, but I hope that our generation will become the biggest hippies the world can possibly, you know, accommodate because we, we're able to communicate with our phones across channels.
People right now are viewing from, I don't know who knows where. That was not the case like 10 years ago. We need to take advantage of all the resources to be able to be in ourselves and belong within ourselves so that they could allow others to feel that they belong as well. So it's a practice. Yeah. Do yeah. you guys feel up for the challenge of being the world's biggest hippies? Yay! I'm up for it. <laughs> Get up your hands back there. There's a topic I'm dying to ask you about, which is about storytelling and connections. Um, one of the central tenets of women at America's platforms is building connections across diverse sets of people. Um, and you did such a beautiful job in this book of making a very deliberate choice that you were never elevated to superhero or mythological figure. You are a very real person going through these very difficult circumstances. Um, you're always emphasizing your humanity, and I think that's so powerful. What can you tell us about storytelling and its power to draw connections between people? Oh my goodness, um, storytelling. Uh, we are stories. You know, we are storytellers by everything we create. Uh, what we are is what we create. What we create is who we are. Um, sometimes we think that we're different from it, but we're not. Uh, well, speaking for myself, I should say, I am. I grew up with this amazing um, caregiver. Uh, her name was Mukamana. Uh, Mukamana. Um, probably she came to live with us, maybe right when I was just born, and. She sang to me probably when I was a baby a lot, but then as an adult, like as, as like, a, not an adult, as like just a little, when I could start taking in the world. Um, I remember my first time, I literally remember my first time noticing the sun. I walked outside and I remember looking at it just like I'm looking at this light and then burning and just my eyes burning. And I walked in and I was screaming. And I was like, what is that? What is that? And she's like, it's the sun. And I remember her walking me through how the sun came up to the sky. And, and so from the minute that I can remember Myself, Mukamana was taking everything, at least in terms of elements, and teaching me how they're all part like of us and how they also have these different characters. And so I wake up, I'm like, how is the sun today? And how is the moon? And how are the stars? And how is water? And how is this? You know, everything moved and everything shook. And and her stories, Mukamana's stories had no end. Of course, the girl who smiled beads, I ended it. But I didn't like the end, so I kept ending it. Like, I kept adding on, I kept adding on and adding on. You know, his stories, um, you know, you know, they were not like a long time ago. It was like, just not so far from here. There was this and there's that and that and that. And what do you think happened next? And so, Storytelling to me was, has always been a way to be able to add on and make sense of the world or make sense of people. And, and if you did not, in my family <laughs> till today, if you did not know how to add on on my story that I had just started, we were not going to be communicating. And so now I use that also as well is like, if we meet each other and I said hello to you, and I say, how are you? And, or you're working on something, you're telling your own story. If you're not willing to add on to me and you're not willing for me to add into you, we're not going to be friends. It's just not going to happen. Because then who am I to you? And who am I to me? And so I believe the art of storytelling is in our everyday relationship. It's our connection point as a human. I forgot, is it with Chino Achebe that said that, you know, humans are the only um, creatures that are connect through stories. There's something like that. I, I, 
put it on Instagram later on, you could find it the right way. But when I heard that as like humans are the one who could pass on through stories, I mean, from like Greek mythology to uh, even different parts of, uh, of Africa, we have our own mythology on how the world came, became. And those stories are about to come forward. You know why? Because through many African and also many indigenous uh, stories, the world doesn't end, the world continues. And at least from different parts of Africa, the stories are coming from a place of abundance, is a full circle and honoring every heartbeat. And so I'm excited for that. I'm excited for stories to connect us. And I'm excited for story to connect us as, as, as women, mm -hmm. um, as a connection point to be able to be creators, to create babies, and babies could be books, and baby can be, you know, art pieces. Babies could be normal humans walking around. And I'm excited for men and women to be able to come together because that's the joint creation. Um, that's, that's the point that I'm excited for our generation and generation to come for us to add on to each other and to connect from a place of abundance. And you're building a platform for that to happen. You're always connecting people. I've heard you call yourself a dot connector. Yeah. I love that phrase. <laughs> yeah. Um, and building connections goes beyond just the book, right? Um, you've traveled the world as an advocate. You've done TED Talks. Um, what can you share with us that you've learned about building connections between very diverse sets of people? Well, I would say that all of us are connectors. Uh, all of us are dark connectors, whichever part. And when I mean dark connector, I actually mean like a heartbeat connecting to another heartbeat. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, because we all are, we're all the minute that you, your heart is beating, you know, the first thing that they, they check with the baby is your heart and they, and anything, any, any breathing thing. And so being able to connect to that. But also like a recent example, like, you know, um, uh, my friend Owen is over there. Uh, <laughs> Owen and I met maybe three years ago. And it's one of my connections three years ago in London. And I was walking with one of my friends. He was like, oh, I'm going to take you to this you know, shop. And it was like chocolate is dark sugar, if you're ever in London, dark sugar. And then I just hear a tap. And a tap, and I just turn around. And I was like, and he's like, open your mouth. And I'm like, <laughs> Open my what? Like you're just a strange man on the road just telling me to open my mouth. And he's like, open your mouth. And I'm like, no. And then he's like, oh my goodness, why don't you trust me? I just want to feed you chocolate. And he had a chocolate in his hand. <laughs> and, 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 and so and I was just like, oh my goodness, okay, I'll take the chocolate. And then we went to the chocolate shop. He was just right at a chocolate shop. And and I, you know, went in and then we, you know, we taught, you know, we, we kind of like played around, there was music playing, and then I walked away, and then two years later, I see someone, I'm in this the nomadic garden, the nomadic garden in right in Shoreditch in London, and uh, uh, he uh, uh, we're all gathered, and it's like all these different beautiful people from like, you know, one of our friends was from, from the Bronx, the other people from like Ireland, some people from who knows where, it's just a bunch of African, African diaspora, all of us hanging out in this nomadic garden, like Middle Eastern, you know, uh, Russians, we're all just hanging out. And next thing you know, I see this this person, and I'm like, I've seen him somewhere, and I couldn't connect. And he was just like, guys, we're going, going, going. And and actually, my friend Nima just walked in also. So she was, I had a loss to her, and I couldn't find her. Next thing you know, it's like 15 of us, just like following this, following Owen, and Owen is just dragging. It's like, oh, we need to go get burritos. We should go get like food, some food. And then after that, we need to go get chocolate. And then when we, get, we got there, they were like, you guys help us move these things on the event tonight. So we're all helping moving things. And next thing you know, he's leading us into the bus. And we were together until like 3 AM. Like 20 people all from the nomadic garden. None of us had ever met. And when we met, we we're all like, just taking care of each other. It was this connection that I 
I'm just getting goosebumps thinking about it. I mean, that night we went to hear some jazz, and like, this jazz was almost like it just flew from New Orleans to having this top jazz, and and we heard this music. It was like Afro punk, like you know, from like this this Nigerian artist. Uh, name again? Demigosh. Demigosh is Irish Nigerian, and he's singing like this, like really intense hard rock. But he's singing like, oh, "I love you, come back to me." But it's like hard rock, like metal, and it's just so beautiful. The point there was a point where I just couldn't. I was in so much joy looking at this community, mostly queer, mostly African, mostly European. All of us in this like basement together just dancing. I fell on the floor in tears and in joy that nothing, not even invisible lines that we call borders could ever divide our hearts and our breath. And that's the true connection that I'm talking about, that I, I make just going on some random tour that I've made up. <laughs> Oh, but now I have a book. I don't have to say that I'm random. I could actually be like, I have a book. Will you let me in? <laughs> I'm just here to connect the heart. So as you see, it is actually the symbols. It's all into very like um, mythology of Rwanda storytelling, where the colors are white and black and red, symbolizing all a part of our human. And so, uh, and also I want to say, as you read uh, the book, well, the book has. Um, this is Claire's Odyssey, Claire's crazy journey. She was like, let's just go, let's go explore Africa. That's, that's the story that I told myself, but actually it was more of wars and nonsense. Mm -hmm. But, um, and so this is Claire's, this is Claire's Odyssey. Uh, and I cannot wait for her to tell her story forward. And then, of course, in every, uh, in every chapter you have a timeline, and the timeline is, our timeline, but is also your timeline. And so when you get to chapter three or four and you're like, I can't do it anymore, just take your notepad and just pause and think about 2004. Maybe 2004 was awesome, maybe it wasn't, you know? Uh, just get in there and just remember 2004. Remember you, remember other people. And so that's also still connecting the dots. The dots connect not only your timeline, but your heartbeat and everyone around you. Amazing. The, yeah. so nice, right? <laughs> and that connects so nicely into something else I wanted to ask you about, which is that I understand that this story was originally pitched as a fairy tale. Yeah. It could not be more different from the story that was written, but yeah. thematically really similar. So can you tell us about that impulse to make this a fairy tale? Yes. So right after I came back from Rwanda in 2004 and graduating from, uh, graduating from college, I I was so hungry to connect to the child in all of us because when I went back to Rwanda, that's the one that I felt was filled the most and it was not tainted by any ideology. And so just remembering like little Clementine just going to everybody, like, what's your name? What do you want? Who are you? What do you, you know? Like, I just wanted to remember like the four or five, six year old Clementine before the world um, show me the other side. Of, of life, um, I, I wanted to write about the girl who smile beads and how the girl who smile beads reminded me of me uh, beyond labels. Mm -hmm. and, and I had the manuscript written down actually from, uh, from like 2013 when I went to South Africa. Um, to the uh, Oprah Winfrey School, and I saw this doll from, it was beaded from head to toe, and all these like beautiful beads, this, this, this beautiful African beads, actually also Indian beads. Um, and I, I saw it and I was just like, oh my goodness, I remember it, I remember it. It's the girl who smiled beads, that's the story, that's the fairy tale, that's my, that's my back story. 
That's my background story. That's the story that I've always lived. That's why I have all these buttons. That's why I have all these beads. I had a bucket of beads, you know, um, in like under my bed in college. And so I started illustrating this whole scene of the, it was 12 uh, scenes of the girl um, smiling beads. And, and, and the girl who smiled beads is of this woman who had everything you could possibly dream of. And, but there was one thing that she did not have. She did not have a life. And one day she cried louder than a thunder and her tears flooded the whole city and the thunder and the rain had to stop and come down and ask her, why are you crying? You have everything you could possibly ever dreamed of. And she said, yes, I do, but I don't have a life. And so the thunder and the rain walked away and then they came back and said, well, we are going to give you life. But this life is going to come with a lot of surprises. And so a few months later, she felt a life in her stomach. And next thing you know, she had this beautiful baby that grew up to be this beautiful girl. But when the girl started smiling, she noticed something. There were all these different gems everywhere. Every day, every day, every day, the whole house was filled of gems. And so the mother started building a wall to be able to protect her, but also to be able to not tell her neighbors, like, yes, I have this child, and this child, when she smiles, gems just appeared everywhere. But the girl uh, was able to, and of, of, also, of course, it sounds really crazy right now that I'm telling the story like this, I was five and six when I made this story up, so bear with me. <laughs> One day it's going to be a children's book, so you have you have more characters into it. And uh, so that's the story that I pitched, but the girl goes from one place to another, um, and she, when she gets there, people look at her, and, and they look at her and say, we've never seen you before. You know, what's your name? Who are you? And before she could say her name, she smiles, just beads appears everywhere. And people collect and they didn't see, see her. So in Rwanda, there's a lot of hills. So she goes from one hill to another. And her mother could follow the trails of beads she left behind. And so I pitched this story to be able to talk about how this story helped me remember me beyond labels. And I pitched it uh, with like a bunch of other newspapers and they were not so into it. And then um, my agent was able to say, you know what, we would like the back, the back, back story before the girl who smiled beads. And, and the story now you have is this. But, you know, it's about, you know, the story of war and what comes after. I'm excited of what comes after now because everybody gets to add on what the girl who smiles beats does wherever you want her to be. So that's the character that I'm really excited to evolve and to bring into your homes. And you can add on your little nieces and nephews could add on. If you have children, they could add on. I actually want children to add on more than adults, but adults can add on as well. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, we have a few minutes left. I want to either invite you to do a reading yeah. or I can jump into the next questions. What would you prefer? Well, since we have a little bit of uh, time, uh, not a lot of time, I am going to read an excerpt. Maybe we have a little bit. Um, it's it's fairy <laughs> love. This is when I knew that was a spot. When I got here, I was like, ooh, this is where it's at. So this is chapter 14. Um, and uh, to give you a little bit of background in chapter 14, this is how my mother uh, used to test us. Um, you know, she would say, go get an orange. And, and she you know, bring an orange and she would cut all to all the pieces and share with everybody. And if you're new, you know, new at our house, you, my mother will know if you were a sharer or not. If you didn't know how to share, my mother then would literally invite the family and you will learn how to share and you're gonna live learning how to share. Um, but <laughs> it, was, it was her secret. I, still, I, I find myself sometimes doing that to people, especially with food and some people don't like it. Um, I think back 
to this often in trying to make sense of the world. How there are people who have so much and people who have so little. And how I fit in with them both. Often, I find myself trying to bridge the two worlds to show people either the people who have so much or the people with so little that everything's yours and everything is not yours. I wish to invite you to understand that boxing ourselves into teeny cubbies based on class, race, ethnicity, religion, anything really comes from a poverty of mind, a poverty of imagination. The world is dull and cruel when we isolate ourselves. Survival, true survival of the body and the soul, and now I've added on in spirit, requires creativity, freedom of thoughts, and collaboration. You might have time and I might have land. You might have an idea and I might have strength. You might have a tomato and I might have nine, a knife. We need each other. We need to say, I honor the things that you respect and I value the things that you cherish. I'm not better than you you are not better than me. Nobody is better than anybody else. Nobody is who you think they are at first glance. We need to see beyond the projection, the categories we cast into each other. Each one of us is so grand more nuance, more extraordinary than anybody thinks, including ourselves. Um, that's my favorite passage because um, it really goes back to one Nima over there is reminding us uh, about the Afro presence, being able to be so into presence and being able to know that we're all here together in this beautiful place called Earth. and. Um, I am just so incredibly honored and grateful um, to be able to share a piece of my life uh, with all of you and as well as to encourage you for you also to share some part of you that um, all of us can learn from and to remember that your story um, is just another story connecting just like this beautiful bracelet or the necklaces, all beads come together. Um, I am, and I know that I sound very optimistic. It's a practice because you could either be optimistic or not be optimistic. And with optimistic comes practice. And with practice comes work. And work comes this full circle of a community of people who are willing and hoping for all of us to be together here. And if we continue channeling that ideology, and if we continue investing our time and our energy and our resources, and maybe it's possible because imagine all the people who imagined us here, who wrote our characters here to be in this room with each other. So, I hope that we continue and extend also the imagination of us being here um, together. Thank you so much. Please join me in thanking Clementine Lamaria. Her book is for sale in the back and also available on Google Play. Thank you so much again for joining us and thank you. Yeah, it's in a Google Play, guys. I'm on a Google Play. I'm in the cloud. Thank you.